panel of high-level experts. I welcome everyone to my left, starting with Ricardo Bonilla Gonzalez, who is the president of Finditer. He's an economist, and he specializes in Latin American and Andean multinationals. We also have Amarita Perez, who is the director of the infrastructure debt investment based in New York, and it's responsible for investments in all sectors in the Americas. In addition to that, we have Paula Caballero, who is the regional managing director for Latin America and the Nature Conservancy. He le she leads a team of more than 300 people in 13 countries from Mexico to Argentina, where they develop new and bold strategies to conserve the global biodiversity. Also with us is Blanca Antisar, who's a director of consultancy at IELTS. She is a professor at the College London University, where she has worked for more than 20 years developing projects for the treatment of water and sewage water around the world. We also have Ms. Rachel Moses, who is a global ambassador and the executive director of Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. In addition to that, we have Gisette Ruiz, who is the general director for Intel for Latin America. She has more than 25 years of experience working with technology, and she's also held posts from Argentina to Mexico, where she's worked in a number of areas such as consumer sales, marketing, distribution channels, and ecosystem development. In addition to that, we have Mr. Bruno Ramos, who is the regional director for the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, for the Americas. It is a specialized UN agency in the area of information technology and communications. So as you can see, we have an outstanding and powerful panel to discuss infrastructure options. And for those of you who are joining us via social media, you can request information. If you'd like to know more about them, you can just go to the website for the event. We will have two sets of presentations following the same order. And if we have time at the end, we will try to take some questions from our audiences. Without further ado, I'd like to start this conversation by highlighting three major challenges, all of which are equally important. The first is infrastructure investment. Latin America and the Caribbean have invested less in infrastructure than other regions, other developing regions in recent decades, and we know that we need more investment if we want the region to speed up its energy transition and proceed with the decarbonization initiatives in a number of areas. So we're going to go to our panel and start with the first question for Ricardo. Welcome, Ricardo. He, Ricardo is from Finditer. Could you tell us about the challenges, the barriers you've encountered in preparing and financing sustainable infrastructure projects at the subnational and municipal levels. Tell us. Thank you for the invitation and welcome to all other panelists. Greetings to our audiences. Latin America is highly centralized. And by being overly centralized, investments have focused primarily in the large cities and some mid-sized cities. But if you go in the hinterlands of Colombia and Peru, what you find is that it is extremely difficult for municipalities to set up infrastructure projects to design them. They don't have the capacity to design them or to go out and get funding and then execute the project. So we find projects that may have been tried twice or three times and they don't work. We see that in water infrastructure, in power infrastructure. We also see it when we look at roads and the lack of tertiary roads. So 
there are many barriers in place. Latin America has had to go back and revisit its provinces. And that return to our provinces means building capacity, capacity to design projects, capacity to obtain funding for those projects, and having more and more resources devoted to financing small infrastructure works because they are the ones that work in these areas of the country. And then we connect those remote areas with the cities that currently control policy. So we want the roads to reach those areas. We want to have river waterways, but we want those remote areas to have roads, to have well-designed markets so that they can get their products to market and so that they can build good education or good infrastructure education, health and water. Water provides for the best public health system. Thank you, and I would note a number of things from what you've said is go to the provinces, build capacity and connect remote areas with the hubs that where decisions are made. Now we go to Marta, our next speaker. I'd like to ask Marta, how can private investors work more effectively with governments? Maybe what is most important is early engagement when governments and administrations start to develop contracts for PPAs. That is where we need to be. We need to be ready as multilateral banks to advise them, let them know whether the clauses they're putting in are bankable or not. We have seen that contracts go out, nobody shows up, there are no bids, and we see what happens with both the public and private sectors. And they lose and the countries lose. So there are no contracts, roads are not built, and that is why it's very important to have an early engagement. The other thing which is also important when it comes to working with the private sector, and I'm speaking as a debt investor, it's important to have liquidity surveys. Governments can be overly ambitious. They want to have contracts, packages for 10, 12 highways, and yet they lack the liquidity to do that. And that is what makes financing agencies to choose the best contracts or those that have stronger agents. So the contracts that win are not always the ones that are most important for the country. So it's important to do these liquidity assessments to know how much money is available in the market that particular year. And that should be the basis for programming bidding exercises. And now, as an institutional investor and also as a representative of banks and even developers, there's something that we consider important is that we need to have governments offer regulatory stability. We are lending at 20, 30-year tenors, and we know governments are going to change. Things will change in the countries. And that is why regulatory stability is important. The rules should not change midstream. And we should not find ourselves in situations where things that we were told were not going to happen do happen. Another thing which is important on our side is transparency when awarding contracts. The region has been highly exposed to corruption. So I believe governments have learned a great deal from this. Transparency in the awarding of contracts has been enhanced. There are no pre or fewer pre-selected winners, and we always look to make sure that the process has been properly conducted. And if contracts are not awarded, we need to wait two to three years 
for another round. You talked about liquidity assessments and early engagement. So yes, Latin America needs to invest more, but it also needs to invest better so that it can foster the economic growth we are seeking. And to do that, we need to determine how to address climate change. That is fundamental. Latin America and the Caribbean need to promote efficient and clean infrastructure, and it must empower citizens so that they can make informed decisions regarding the quantity and quality of infrastructure services they want. And this brings me to welcome our next panelist, Marta. Marta. Does Latin America or do Latin America and the Caribbean have a comparative advantage when it comes to nature-based solutions considering our socioeconomic and physical resources? Thank you and thank you to the IDB and my fellow panelists. Latin America is well endowed when it comes to natural capital and social capital. I will not go over all the numbers we all know to indicate our biodiversity status, but we do have 32% of the world's fresh water, so we are ahead of any other region in the world. And thanks to that asset, we are a major source of food. Latin America currently accounts for 45% of net international agricultural trade. And just to give you an example, the La Plata Basin is the major commodities exporter in the world. These are economic numbers, but that is, they're predicated on natural wealth, environmental wealth, and we know that that wealth is being threatened for economic and social reasons. And we must take action so that we can reverse efforts to degrade, deforest the area so that we can salvage the region's economic or biodiverse heritage. So when we speak of sustainability in nature, what we mean by this is that we need to ensure that investments, solutions, initiatives need to grow in a way that supports those three areas, economic, social, and natural capital. And that means harnessing nature, using that natural capital for economic and social purposes. We have a region which is rich in natural resources that can be used for economic and social purposes. So we do have a comparative advantage, but we need to capitalize on it by using investment portfolios that include nature-based solutions. As Ricardo said, investments in regenerative agriculture, in water, because these are investments in health and water safety. It's not only a good business, but it also provides climate change benefits. We have seen that one third of the mitigation actions we need to reach Paris targets, staying below two degrees, one third of that can be achieved through nature-based solutions. But the only way we'll be able to capitalize on that comparative advantage and truly play the role we can play globally as a region is if we change the approach and the mindset. We need to have a long-term vision and a comprehensive vision when we assess the return on investment and how we allocate our capital. It behooves the financial sector to step up investments that are not only nature-based, but also in, they need to look at what the productive sectors need to truly bring about the needed transformation in agriculture, in urban, the urban sectors, in transport and energy. To do that, we need financing, we need long-term investment options, we need specialized advisory services, and we need a capital that can wait for results, can finance the initial cost, and wait for the benefits of that green infrastructure. So we need to look at those three 
types of capital so that we can use our competitive advantage to obtain the short and long-term benefits the region needs. And that is what previous speakers have also said. Thank you very much. It's really a delight to hear you speak. You've told us that our natural capital is economic capital, it's economic wealth, and that we need to find nature-based solutions because they are key. And to do that, we need to innovate. So that brings me to Blanca. And I'd like to ask you, given that sustainable and inclusive infrastructure is necessary in Latin America and the Caribbean, and to achieve that, we need to innovate. How would you say we can innovate in water and transport services in Latin America and the Caribbean? Which are the innovation areas that you think would provide the highest return and improve both the coverage and quality of services? Thank you very much, Rosalina, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you to the panel. I'm pleased to be a part of this panel this afternoon. Yes, we do need to innovate. Today, we have heard descriptions of all the challenges Latin America faces. I won't repeat them. There are many. And we need to start at the beginning. We need to consider inclusion, innovating in technology and in how technology is used. As was said before, we need to apply innovative business models which take into account a circular economy, which make it possible for us to adopt green solutions, digital solutions. We need to apply different institutional models that are compatible with both economic investments and efficiency in infrastructure so that startups can properly integrate. The company I work for has developed innovation platforms, startup accelerators, and financial instruments tied to a technical support system which is unique to accelerate the adoption of innovative solutions in the sector, especially in water and sanitation. In tandem, we've developed ecosystems, global and local ecosystems, linked to the innovations that I will describe shortly. And we're looking to attract investors and find ways to adapt these innovations to Latin America. One is the DAP Technology and Approval Group. We It was um, developed 10 years ago in the UK. And it has now been um, transferred worldwide. We have worked with more than 300 users mainly water and sanitation service providers. We have worked with innovative technologies, and many of those have been presented to service operators. Some have been marketed, and as was mentioned before, marketing or adoption remains a challenge. We see many pilots that are repeated and solutions are not found. So now what we're trying to do is accelerate adoption. We have found more than $1 billion in external investments to support these technologies. Another innovation is the Water Innovation Living Lab, another startup. It was launched a year ago in Italy. And with this accelerator, we've already identified almost 100 global startups from Canada to the US, Mexico, Germany, Netherlands, and even all the way to South Africa and Australia. We have selected 10 of these, and we are currently supporting them. Another financial instrument is an instrument which developed more than a year ago. And for that trial reservoir, we have online indicators with climate change agendas. We're trying to support more than 10 pilots per year at a regular scale, deploying $10 million the first year. And our objective is to reduce the time it takes to go from the pilot to the operation, also at the same time reducing carbon emissions by 100 tons in year one. 
It's also essential to align our regional strategy with a green agenda, but also with a digital agenda. And to do that, we are launching the reservoir project in Latin America, in Brazil, as we speak. And we are focusing on our climate change agenda, managing water, managing sanitation, providing services in neighborhoods, in um, settlements, in areas where it's very difficult to reach the end user. To conclude my first question, our objective for the region is to launch the WHEEL initiative so that we can have startups come in, so that we can connect those startups with water and sanitation service providers. And we think the bank can be a key partner in that regard. Thank you very much. I don't know you, but I very much like what I hear. People say that innovation is complicated, that it's not happening. And here we have a very clear example, more than 10,000 startups which have already been assessed. And things are happening. They're happening in the world. They're happening in Latin America. And one of the areas which also calls for major innovation is fair transitions. And we will now go to Rachel so that she can tell us what is happening in the Caribbean when it comes to energy transition. We know that Caribbean countries rely heavily on importing fossil fuels for to generate electricity, also for transportation. And this exposes them to the price volatilities that we are all familiar with. So against that backdrop, We'd like to know what can be done differently, I stress differently, to accelerate climate action in the Caribbean. And could you please give us some very specific examples of good things that are happening in that? Having me. Um, so there are a number of things that can take place, right? And, and we all know the challenges. We have, you know, um, competing priorities. We have a lack of liquidity. These projects require a lot of upfront capital. The types of returns that institutional investors are looking for are commercial returns, which these projects are typically not sufficiently prepared to, to um, sustain. We have a, a fragmented market. And with all of these things together, what, what the opportunity is that it presents is an opportunity to collaborate, uh, to collaborate across many of these small island states so that we are massing bigger projects together that, it, that makes them more attractive to institutional investors. It also allows us to take a step back and look at the market as a whole. Things like green hydrogen, and IDB has been incredibly supportive in preparing data and helping us with studies and looking at how do we amalgamate this whole market to attract a green hydrogen investment. We have myriad resources. We have solar, we have wind potential, and we have tons of, uh, of geothermal. And what we need to be able to do is to collaborate around public and private sector together to use these resources to create what we want to uh, consider a single export market for green hydrogen in the Caribbean. So using resources from the uh, Eastern Caribbean, Northern and Eastern Caribbean, and using the expertise in oil and gas exploration in the Southern Caribbean, and collaborating towards that exportation. And that's what we'd like to do. And the, the nice thing about that is that we have built-in customers because we already serve the airline industry, our major export is tourism. We already serve the shipping industry. And so we can help them in their energy transition while helping ourselves in our own energy transition and being more innovative. I, saw, I heard so many good ideas about what's taking place, and so it's wonderful to see all of that coming together. But it requires that we make progress with each increment and we continue to press until we have an agreement. It's great to listen to Raquel. I don't know if you saw me smile when she mentioned green hydrogen. I love green hydrogen. I'm a fan. And as Raquel has said, we need to find ways to collaborate strategically. And I stress collaboration because we cannot do this alone. 
we all need to work together to make progress. So another important component when it comes to sustainable infrastructure, it's digital transformation, connectivity, digitalization for prosperity and growth. And this requires a great deal of effort. So now I would like to ask Giselle to tell us how she sees the future of digital technology and innovation and sustainable infrastructure in Latin America in the midst of a technological revolu revolution which is fully underway. It is here to stay. But how do you see this when it comes to infrastructure services and what are the key trends? Good afternoon to everyone. I very much appreciate the IDB's invitation and being here with my fellow panelists. We've all spoken about challenges in Latin America when it comes to implementing technology. We, too, have challenges. Latin America is one of the regions which lags behind when it comes to implementing major emergent technologies, especially when it comes to the technologies that are going to provide for mobility and self-driving vehicles. I'm speaking also of 5G bands, also the low rate of pilots in the region for self-driving vehicles, also aspects pertaining to security. So we do face a number of challenges. At the same time, we are confronted with a major opportunity. Latin America has a population of 660 million people, people who are connected. 74% of people in Latin America have internet access and they use the internet as compared to 60% around the world. According to the UN, we rank second when it comes to urbanization in the planet, around the, 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 the world, and all of this brings challenges as far as the technology ecosystem. The region in recent decades has lagged behind, and we have seen leading global technology countries coming to the region, expanding their presence. Since 2019, we have also seen a rise in venture capital flows, and this has helped develop the startup system. Much has been said here about innovation, and this has been seen in key segments in the region, especially in the areas of commerce and fintech. And especially in these last few years, in the context of the pandemic, we have seen growth in relation to major population segments that have gone through the first major digital transition in the last few years, all of which presents an opportunity. We have seen a significant growth in Latin American unicorns, over 46 businesses, the purpose of which is to innovate to address major problems in the region. You asked about the dialogue regarding uh, the sustainability of infrastructure, and that is key because citizen demand will continue to grow and basically lead to greater demand and exert more pressure on essential infrastructure in the region. Here we are talking, for instance, to provide some figures, um, we're talking about uh, transport and the uh, car ownership, which grew from 3% in the 90s to uh, 30 in 2030. Energy demand will double by 2030, mainly uh, the uh, demand for lighting, heating of water, industry demand. So in this demand context, we basically require technology. 
when we get to the next question, I'll speak a bit more about those technologies we have, which have a key role so that the infrastructure must be sustainable and it is also vital for sustainable growth in the region. There are challenges and opportunities. 74% access to internet. What a fascinating figure, even higher than the global average. And with that, I would now like to invite our last panelist for this first round of questions, Bruno. Since this happens to be your fear, we could say, what is the ITU doing to improve connectivity infrastructure in Latin America? I think you've had to do with that 64%, haven't you? And what are the actions and recommendations on policies that would achieve greater impact? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I thank very much for the bank's invitation. I'm very pleased to discuss these issues with you. It is a very broad question, but I will propose an answer. I work with countries so as to support the design of long-term public policies. And why? Let me explain. The UN Secretary General has said that in the work to implement the Agenda 2030 SDGs, the UN Secretariat must support member states which will implement the changes to achieve the goals. So our work really is more related to working with administrations so as to come up with concrete public policies with a view to these types of actions. And when it comes to the ITU, we work on information and communication technology. And in terms of connectivity, the idea is to enable states to have concrete public policies. You mentioned the issue of predictability and transparency. Having policies for investment by the private sector in the long term. So unless we have a basic infrastructure that is good, we won't have public sector investment, which happens to be the sector that will carry out the connectivity-related investments. I can provide a few examples briefly with regard to the implementation and deployment of 5G networks, which are the major issue for states, unless we specifically plan to see how we will deal with the public frequency bits using the resources so as to enable the resources to be fed back into implementation in a way that furthers inclusion, it won't work unless we have a broad mindset in public policy so as to include security as well as the ability of people to use the services. Unless we take this holistic view, all developments in the sector in terms of the regulatory and legal structure that will support this, unless we have that, it will be somewhat more difficult to implement this. So my first message is that we need to work in order for the countries in our region, in the Americas, have a longer term view so as to foster public, uh, private sector investment with a more modern legal and regulatory framework. One of the key elements you have just shared with us is the role of international cooperation in order to help the policies and the policy design take place in a manner that is transparent with a long-term view involving all sectors for inclusive connectivity. Now I'd like to come back to one of the bits of data that uh, Professor Amar shared with us. He said that 13.2% uh, of GDP for 10 years is 
needed in terms of infrastructure investment in Latin America to advance the SDGs. And this brings us back to Ricardo. Ricardo, what do you think should be the role of public and development banks to support private financiers to provide digital and sustainable infrastructure services? So we are dealing with two key problems. Generally, Latin American countries haven't been able to achieve physical integration. They lack appropriate multimodal mobility. So physical integration has not been adequately achieved. And with the advent of the digital world, a unique opportunity arises for digital integration. The pandemic has taught us that when you look at another country that is not digitally connected, the social gaps widen. And today, we need to reintegrate countries. And the best way to go has to do with digital integration. It's easier to pursue digital integration than physical integration. But this requires major investments in fiber optics, in communication, wireless communications. We also need to increase speed and ensure system sustainability. I really like the information shared here. 64 percent have digital access. Everyone has a mobile phone. But how can we ensure that that will be sustainable? That everyone will have a signal and that people will actually be able to use the net, because that's what it's about, digital integration. So development banking needs to strengthen investment in fiber optics, in wireless communications, enhancing Wi-Fi, guaranteeing the highest possible speed, while at the same time supporting all of this process. That's what I would say. Thank you, Ricardo. Marta, is there any other way, in your view, through equity or other financial investments to um, enhance the development of digital infrastructure? What do you think would be especially useful, and what are the international financial institutions that could be conducive to this, considering the different jurisdictions that exist in Latin America. Some five years ago, if we looked at the financing of most projects, there was a huge difference between financing in Latin America and the rest of the world, such as Europe or the United States. Latin America was regarded as a highly complex jurisdiction, so financial structures had to be simple. This has changed significantly, and there are different liquidity sources. Originally, there were just commercial banks, local or international, uh, in addition to the multilaterals working with them. Now we see institutional investors on board, such as Alliance Global Investors, and we are getting to see more and more sources and more competition, which very much helps when it comes to the rate levels. You know, the competition with supply and demand leads to the structures becoming less and less expensive. But also on the project and client side, there's the ability to demand better structural terms. On the other hand, we are going through a period of macroeconomic instability almost in every country, which means that the role of multilaterals becomes all the more important. A couple of years ago, I would have said that in certain countries, there's absolutely no need for support by a multilateral. Now they're the best travel companion one could think of. And I think to a great extent this has had to do with macroeconomic instability in countries. But this is also related, as far as the IDB is concerned, uh, to the fact that the people there are so competent and creative when it comes to 
continually reinventing yourselves and providing support and giving investors such as us the structures or support we need in each of the jurisdictions concerned. So I think that is quite important. And you also asked about what other types of structures or capital sources one could think of. Now that blended finance is such a thing, there are countries, and we could say Latin America could be divided into countries in which commercial or institutional banks uh, have direct access, or countries like in Central America or the Caribbean where the issue of credit rating comes into the picture and risk ratings means it's a little bit more difficult to step in. So it's great that through products such as blended finance, investors are able to fund the projects that we all need. Your answer leaves stability, support, and cooperation as high. Let's considering the high levels of water and hydro stress in our productive areas, which in some cases have limited access to safe drinking water. I would like to ask you, especially what the advantage would be, Paula, of having nature-based solutions embedded in national investment plans? And how would this contribute to long-term resilience building? But also, how can we get policymakers, I'll take my hat off, forget about me, how do we get policymakers to really do what it takes uh, to implement these nature-based solutions. Thank you very much. That's a very relevant question to the region, and I think the evidence is out there. Today, it is understood that nature-based solutions are socially acceptable and also profitable, not only financially, but also economically. There are various studies that have demonstrated that investments in green or natural infrastructure can be up to 50% less expensive than traditional infrastructure, while at the same time offering 28% extra added value. If we factor in the dividends in terms of um, carbon um, trapping, storing, and um, we could see investors annually saving up to $250 billion a year according to some studies. So investing in these kinds of solutions yields short and especially long-term um, benefits, including as regards reputational risks, social dividends, opportunities for further new investments. And there's also reference to water security, and several of you have talked about water. And let me give a couple of examples related to uh, water security. So as you see, what needs to be considered by uh, decision makers. Rio Ecinto, which um, provides 10% of water to the city of Quito, every dollar invested in sustainable management of the watershed through better farming practices, re sanitation, rehabilitation, restoration, every dollar invested yields $2.15 dollars due to lower costs of treatment, uh, water distribution, and so on. So that's an investment that keeps on giving. And now let's look at the opposite example. In 2014, 2015, there was the very uh, tough drought in Sao Paulo. We all still remember the cost of drought is estimated to have reached 1.6 billion reais. If these kinds of solutions, like the uh, Rio Cinto, a case, if that had been implemented, the cost would have been up to 28% lower because the reductions in base flows would have been less severe. By calculating the cost benefit of the system, the present value would have been 144 million reais. And if we include the carbon related benefits, the value would go up to 632 million. And the fact is that nowadays, globally, 32% of basins providing water to cities, the most productive uh, areas of countries where the GDP of countries is especially concentrated. Well, there we see 
worrying levels of water stress. And despite the obvious figures that point to effectiveness in the short and long term, the reality is that investments in these kinds of solutions are not taking place at the required pace. About six hundred billion dollars is being invested in water and sanitation. And nature-based solutions account for only under one percent. This is not sustainable, not only from the environmental, but also from the economic and social point of view. So I think there's this appeal. If we want to really deal with the increasing droughts and floods and the problems related to water supply in a region like Latin America, we must combine these three forms of capital, natural, social, and economic, using nature-based solutions with the financial sector playing a leadership role. You put it very well, and let me repeat this, 50% cheaper to implement infrastructure through nature-based solutions, 28% lower costs when dealing with extreme uh, climate events. Uh, thank you very much for that. Now, I would really like to ask Blanca, what are the main challenges for innovation? And if you had to name a few constraints, what would they be? But we'd also like to know what successful experiences you could tell us about of adaptive innovation in Latin America and the Caribbean. I know time is running short, so I will ask you to be as concrete as possible in your answers. Yes, thank you very much. I can only agree with what has been mentioned so far. I love nature-based solutions, Paula, as I've already mentioned. But one of the issues we see, and that's why the innovative solution projects we are launching in all countries and that we also want to launch in Latin America have to do with these major cycles. Solutions providers in the field of water and sanitation, which is my focus area, well, you, you need to uh, make sure that the technology does what it claims it does before making the final investment. And the difficulty with these uh, green and nature-based solution is the extended cycles that uh, are needed. And like the case with digital solutions, which require much shorter cycles, and adaptation normally takes place in very short spans under a year. whereas. In the other case, we are looking at even years before adoption. We need to change that. In order to do that, as I've already said, we have launched different initiatives now in Latin America. We are launching the trial reservoir with a focus on climate change, but also on infrastructure management for water, for energy, because in order to generate energy, you need water. And in order to treat water and do the sanitation side of it, you need loads of energy. So that can't be separate. We need to work on both things. The barriers to innovation now. Often what we see is that we start with a poor choice when it comes to innovation or there's poor understanding of the added value that innovation may bring. There's a lack of sponsorship by the uh, executive. There are issues with the processes. Uh, in terms of how to innovate, there's the rejection of the new. You know, the water sector tends to be quite risk averse and for good reasons. In the case of startups, often there's a lack of understanding of how the water and sanitation providers work. So we need mechanisms that bring the different stakeholders and parties to the table, the startups, the investors, the end users, everyone. And for that, we are making major efforts. Here in Latin America, we have already brought the Technology Approval Group, TAC, which we've launched in Ecuador several years ago, in fact. And we are working directly with water utilities, uh, mostly private, but we also want to make contact with public utilities so as to convey this business model and uh, way of working so as to show how we can help end users manage the major challenges. And through the trial reservoir, we are attempting to provide support 
for startups to be able to enter the market with significantly, low, significantly lower risk. Now I will briefly take off my consultant hat, just like you, and I will put on my educator and uh, mother's uh, hat, the mother of a daughter. We are talking a lot about uh, digitalization, and the figures we are looking at suggest that the skills we'll need in the future include by up to over 90 percent STEM, science, technology, engineering, maths. But when we actually go to the schools, the girls that choose those sciences, the career paths, are less than 30 percent. So if we want a future with diversity and uh, gender inclusion as well, and we want to be more innovative, it has been abundantly proven that innovation always benefits through diversity in the workforce. So we need to ensure that we will attract both men and women, but we should focus on increasing the number of girls that are fond of maths, engineering, science, and technology. Thanks. Thank you. Innovation with a gender focus for sustainable infrastructure, which again brings us to the Caribbean. We are aware of the significant infrastructure challenges in the Caribbean. I would love for you to tell us about how we can close that gap, which we know is huge. And what's the role of the private sector in building climate resilience? We're seeing great amounts of innovation in the private sector. We, we're seeing things like new early warning systems from entrepreneurs. And you can just look at uh, the experience in Africa with the recent cyclones, the difference in the experience from Malawi to Mozambique. Now, they were both devastated, but, but certainly the level of devastation in Malawi is so much more um, extreme because of the lack of early warning systems and, and implementing those. So it's really important that we put in place that kind of solution. The second thing is we're working with a company called, a private sector company called Partana, and they are developing the first carbon negative communities. And so working with the government of Bahamas as a start, but looking at other uh, other communities as well, and we're working with them to connect them into other countries in the region. But we have to innovate our way out of this and develop resilient solutions for housing that can also protect us from harm. So as we rebuild from things like Hurricane Dorian in Abaco and other places, how are we rebuilding to a more resilient standard? But the challenge that we're facing is that uh, countries are like, how do I pay for this? And why should I pay for this? And so I think that's where we want to have private sector and innovation meeting philanthropy to be able to close the gaps so that we can get that funding from end to end and using blended finance to implement these kinds of solutions well. It's important to recall carbon neutral communities to facilitate the building of infrastructure and to address risks. And another important risk we must address when looking at infrastructure sustainability is related to this question for yourself. What's the role of governments in fostering the adoption of these risk reduction solutions, um, looking at emerging technologies? What are the main barriers to that? Are some of those legal? What do you think? Uh, very well. Um, I think it is important to look at a number of elements. First of all, to accelerate some pilots, reference has been made to barriers in large-scale implementation of either nature-based or technological solutions. Pilots always help to understand the challenge we are seeking to tackle. You know, implementing a small-scale pilot which you can then scale up and extend to uh, the rest of a country or to the region. I think that's an important point. And I believe governments should prioritize a digital transformation agenda and an agenda for the implementation of new technologies. That should be at the heart of investments and of 
training when it comes to businesses and universities. That sort of public-private collaboration alongside universities is very important. And in order for that to happen, of course, you need to understand again the role of technology as part of the solutions we are trying to come up with. It's not just about having a digitization agenda, but rather it's about how through technology we can resolve the major challenges we face as a region on the social or infrastructure or competitiveness fronts. In terms of how to reduce risks or, or barriers more precisely, there's much talk about the legal barriers. I think that is one part of it, but at the end of the day, as already mentioned, when you're clear as to what problem you want to solve and what the solution is, legal barriers no longer have such a major part to play and sustainable solutions are found. For example, sometimes you talk about import barriers. We have seen instances in the region in countries with more challenges or barriers when it comes to imports where we have been able to launch projects with over a million mobile devices for the education of at a time when governments are convinced of the role technology has to play in addressing the major challenges, the barriers start to fall away. And finally, I think these kinds of conversations are very important and dialogue needs to continue to be encouraged, you know, both within and between academia, governments, and private businesses, also including such entities and institutions like the IDB that help us advance the key agendas for the region. Thank you. Yes, we need to know about technology. We need a digitalization agenda, and we need to engage in dialogue. And I would like to talk to Bruno. Tell us, Bruno, what your institution is doing to enhance digital inclusion. Do you have any good examples of digital inclusion in the LAC region? Thank you very much. For five seconds, the lights went off, so I was able to see you for a moment. And I'm so glad to hear about such good ideas here, which means that humankind does have a future. As I have very little time, I will just give an idea and provide a brief example that you may perhaps take away with you. Inclusion through knowledge and training. In 2014, we started off with a very tiny project because in 2016, you might recall the Olympics were to take place in a developing country in a region. In 2016, Brazil hosted the Olympics and Paralympics. So we started in 2014 with a very small three-year project with annual events while preparing a document to present when the Paralympics were to start, the um, Accessible Americas project for persons with disabilities. The idea was to use ICTs to further the inclusion of people. So I presented at the start of the Olympics and Paralympics uh, in early 2016, a document on best practices and on how to use ICTs to include persons with disabilities. And this year, in 2023, we'll have the 10th edition, which will take place in Cuba in November. And why this? Because having people gather to have discussions and to train and to exchange knowledge, that 
will foster inclusion of all. We're not talking about inclusion of those who already have some sort of uh, access within society. We're talking about people who don't have this. So this is the small story of success after 10 years. We started nice and tiny. And what I mean is that when there's the love, when it's a labor of love, when you start, things will end up working with training and knowledge. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, thanks to all of you joining us today. I think the contributions by our excellent panelists have been wonderful. The role of sustainable infrastructure is important, as well as resilience, as well as being familiar with the challenges we face through innovation, collaboration, and joining forces in an inclusive fashion. We can foster the achievement of the SDGs on the Agenda 2030. We're halfway down the road, and uh, I think we've had good examples of what has happened, what is happening, and what we want to see happening. I would like to invite our panelists to tell us 30 seconds in a tweetable phrase, 144 characters, what three elements they believe are instrumental to achieve sustainable and resilient infrastructure. 30 seconds, Ricardo, you go first. Sustainable infrastructure integrates countries, it generates um, inclusion, and it reduces inequality. Great, Marta. I would say public-private collaboration, government support, and having available venture capital. Great, that's under 144. In 2030 is today, not in seven years today, we are going to chart the course to sustainability and inclusion. Thank you, Blanca. We are working in the region to boost startups and establish connections with service providers, and the IDB is our key partner. That was a little over 144, but what a great message. Rachel? We need will, persistence, determination, and insistence. We must be insistent. Thank you. Excellent. Implementing new technologies which have open standards that are interoperable, that are based on ethical and digital security principles. That is something we all understand. Bruno, your turn. I didn't give this much thought. Uh, 144. Well, I would say that when we think of inclusion, we have to start with a person. If we start with a person, we are on the right track. Excellent. That closes our panel. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you to the panelists. And please don't go away, because there's going to be another section that's going to be outstanding. Thank you.